In the last video, we mentioned pair production. We looked at the equation for photon energy, and we looked at the equation E equals mc squared. In this video, we're going to continue down that tangent. Now, annihilation happens when matter and antimatter interact. When an electron and a positron interact, they come close enough to each other that they can interact, they will annihilate each other. All the mass that they contain gets turned into energy. Remember the equation was E equals mc squared. That tells you how much energy you get out. And that energy forms two identical photons travelling in opposite directions. Those photons have a energy that's related to the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation through the equation E equals hf. But a single photon is all that's needed to decay into an electron and a positron. Now these diagrams here, I have to be very, very clear, these are particle interaction diagrams that you see in A-level physics, but they're not quite right. There's a type of diagram called a Feynman diagram where antimatter is represented with an arrow going backwards in the time axis. And that's how Feynman interpreted antimatter, as matter going backwards in time. But that's not for this video. So we can now create particles. But we want better ways of detecting them. So a larger device called a bubble chamber, I'm picturing it here. Bubble chambers work very similarly to cloud chambers, except they use liquid hydrogen, which usually is very, very cold. But you heat that liquid hydrogen up. Now, where it says superheated liquid hydrogen, that's still really cold, but it's under pressure. So even though you've heated the hydrogen, it remains a liquid. And that means particles passing through this superheated liquid hydrogen will cause it to vaporize, leaving a little trail of bubbles behind, which is why it's called a bubble chamber. Now, we don't tend to use bubble chambers anymore. We have better detectors. Bubble chambers work by having cameras pointing in and taking photographs synchronized with a piston that changed the pressure to make the superheated liquid hydrogen. Every time it pressurized so that you'd be able to see these bubbles, a camera would take a picture. And then physicists would have to analyze the tracks on those pictures, the same way as they did with cloud chambers, taking pictures and then analyzing those tracks. But there are other sorts of detectors. For example, this drift chamber detector, which has wires with a huge potential difference between them. If charged particles pass between those wires, they can cause the air between those wires to ionize, which means you get a spark. That spark is a flow of charge. So you can detect tiny little peaks in current uh, between these wires and use that to track where the particle is going. Very sophisticated computers can then visualize where those particle tracks are going. And you can see on the bottom right there, we've got a picture of um, it's an art installation at CERN, which shows, well, I think it's a simulation, not actually a, a real demonstration, but it shows cascades of particles from the atmosphere passing through the room and causing little lights to light up corresponding to the positions in the drift chamber behind. But detectors got more and more and more sophisticated, and they involved things called calorimeters. Calorimeter is used to measure the energy, and you might have done some calorimetry earlier on in school, perhaps in biology or chemistry, where you burn a crisp and use it to heat up water and measure the temperature change in water. Well, these are much more sophisticated calorimeters. They sort of work on the same principle, where particles that are created by a collision in the center here and in here, and then radiate out from that point, are absorbed and we can measure the amount of energy that is absorbed. The middle parts of these detectors have parts very similar to those drift chambers, which detect the path of the particles. Those charged particles leave a track that computers can analyze. And there are detectors on the end of this one here, muon detectors, that can detect where the muons pass through the ends of the detector. Now at CERN, for example, they do something very clever. They have at least four different experiments all on the same ring. They all operate independently of each other. And sometimes they're trying to discover the same thing, but they're working separately so that if each of them makes a discovery, they can compare them. They can check each other's results with a different set of apparatus using different techniques to see if those results are reproducible. Now, the particle properties that you can determine by looking at them in these detectors are the mass, 
You can determine the mass partly by the energy of the collision and how many particles are emitted, but also through this process of calorimetry. You can determine the charge by having strong magnetic fields causing the charged particles to be deflected, and by measuring that deflection we can determine the charge. And then there's another property here, strangeness. Kaons, if you remember, were odd because they seem to have a longer half-life than we expected for their mass. So those particles got referred to as strange particles, and strangeness is a particle property. And lastly, by looking at how those particles decay, we can decide whether the proton lies in the decay chain or not. So for muons, they never decay into protons. They end up decaying into an electron. But for pions, well, they'll never decay into protons either. But for neutrons, they will decay into protons. Magnetic fields deflect particles according to their charge-to-mass ratio, which is also called specific charge. The word specific in physics just means divided by mass. You might have heard it with terms like specific heat capacity or specific latent heat. Specific just means divided by mass. And so if a particle has a higher specific charge, it will be deflected more by the magnetic field and so have a smaller circular path. In A-level physics, you'll learn about how you can make measurements of the diameter of the circular path and use that to determine the specific charge of the particle. So now we have a means for accelerating particles and we have a means for detecting the particles that are produced when particles collide. So what did we find? In the next video, we'll be having a look at something called the particle zoo.